folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This has been Bible Week at Bethel Church. We have just concluded our first ever, first annual uh, Midwest Bible Conference, and we hope to have many, many more. We've been talking about the Bible all week. In fact, I've been talking about things related to the Word of God and concerns that I see related to the Word of God on uh, Sunday school, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Pastor Mike online, and uh, I'm just trying to get out as much information as I can concerning the Word of God. We've had Chris Pinto here talking about the history of the Bible, including the Vatican's attack on the Word of God, on the preserved Word of God, by way of the introduction of these phony, fake, Manus, Greek manuscripts, the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, and some of these others that has been introduced into uh, modern scholarship so that the Bible scholars of today, going all the way back to West Cotton Hort, um, and the pulpit preachers, and the seminary students, and the seminary teachers have all accepted the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus and these, what I believe are these fake, phony, Gospels that the Bible warned us about, uh, they have accepted these manuscripts as superior to the ones that underlie the King James, even though over 5,000, here I am talking about manuscript evidence, but anyway, over 5,000 manuscript, uh, whole manuscripts in the New Testament or partial manuscripts of the New Testament agree 98, 99% of the time with each other that underlies the King James. That has been the standard for, what do you think, 18, 1900 years until Westcott and Hort came in and introduced these other manuscripts and said, oh, these are older, so therefore they are the original, or like the original manuscripts, even though they disagree with each other thousands of times. Anyway, that's some of the information that we've heard this week. Pastor Reg Kelly. Uh, has preached, and, and I have talked about various things concerning the Bible. To me, the greatest area of attack has been against the Word of God. Satan has lodged an attack against God's words going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You see it all through the scriptures. It's what Paul warned us about in 2 Corinthians 11. He said, as the serpent beguiled Eve. As the serpent beguiles Eve, that's how the devil corrupts the minds of people away from the integrity and the trustworthiness of the Word of God. You hear statements, especially against the King James, like, well, it's archaic. It was based upon uh, it's inferior manuscripts. It wasn't translated right. They made mistakes. King James was a mason. Uh, Francis Bacon uh, wrote the Bible. You hear all kinds of stuff like that. And, what it, and, and you almost never hear this same crowd saying, well, I hate the NIV because the NIV had this or the NIV says this or the NIV committee was this. You never hear them say things like that. It's always against the King James. You ought to think about that, all right? And so with this particular teaching, I'm going to get into it. This particular teaching here is uh, a question that I had in my mind years ago as God was bringing me to uh, this point in my life where I relied upon, I trusted every word of God that I had printed in my Bible. So the question that I'm asking today. This is something that hopefully I can with, I've got uh, 75 slides full of scripture. If I can use this today to help you with the question of, can I trust what I'm reading in my King James Bible? Can I, can I have faith in it? Can I trust it? Can I believe without any doubt that every word in this book is 100% true? You know, they say, well, you know, King James onlyism is a cult, and, they, and King James onlyism is idolatry, and this and that and the other. 
Let me address that. And I'm going to address that with this video. The, the real question, instead of them lobbing these titles and these names, King James onlyism is a cult and things like that. The real question is, is this Bible, the Word of God, the Word of God, is this Bible perfect? Has it been preserved? Is this Bible, in fact, the very Word of God spoken of in the Scriptures? And is this Bible Jesus Christ? That's the question. And you may think in your mind, well, okay, he's going overboard here. He's uh, saying something that uh, there's just no way that anybody can believe this. Is this Bible as trustworthy and reliable and does this Bible have all of the attributes that is mentioned in the Bible concerning Jesus? Let's start out with what the Bible calls Jesus. Let's start there and we'll proceed forward. You'll see where we're going as we move along. First thing, John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, in almost every modern translation, with the exception of the uh, New World Translation, which is the Jeho Jehovah's Witness Bible, in almost every modern translation, John chapter 1, verse 1 is nearly identical, if not completely identical, with the way the King James renders it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Thousands upon thousands of scholars have gone over the Greek text of John chapter 1 and they have all agreed that this verse ascribes deity to Jesus Christ and his title is the Word. And if you'll notice, we look back on the screen here, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice the word Word, that's kind of hard to say, the word Word is all capitalized and it's mentioned three times. Now that may not give you a kick, but just remember that there are three parts to the divinity, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. In fact, let me say it the way the Bible says it. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Remember in heaven, the um, living creatures are saying, holy, holy, holy. Why three times? Because it points to the Godhead. Think of Genesis chapter one. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice that God is speaking of himself in plural terms and he does that three times. Let, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So you have this pattern in the Bible, God referring to himself, number one, as plurality. Number two, referring to himself often in the form of like three times, holy, holy, holy. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, number one, the Bible gives the title of Jesus Christ, gives him the title of the Word, not a word, not something similar to the Word, or something similar to a word, gives him the title of the Word. Think about it. We know that God created the entire universe by speaking, and God said, let there be light, and God said, let the firmament be, and you know, all these things in Genesis 1 where it says, and God said. Well, that is his word, and Jesus is his word. So, we know at least that the spoken word of God, when, what the words that come out of God's mouth, and Jesus are one and the same. We have no problem with that, but th let's take it a little bit deeper as we examine the name of Jesus Christ. In 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And once again, we have not only do we have a verse pointing to the fact that Jesus is divinity, that he is fully God, but we also have another verse pointing to the fact, and we have three here, the, we have it spelled out, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. But we also have the relationship between Jesus and the words that proceeded forth out of the mouth of God. Now, do I have a complete, full understanding of that? There's no way. 
there's, I can't even understand eternity because for me, everything has, you know, it goes by the clock and it has an ending, it has a beginning. We can't understand that, but I believe it. And I believe it exactly the way the Bible says. By the way, you've heard me say this before. I've been saying it all week. First John 5, 7 is in the King James. It is not in the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard Version. It's not in the modern translations of the Bible. Even in the New King James Bible, they put it in there, but they put a footnote. And they want you, if you look down at the bottom or look in the margin, it'll say something like, the earliest and best manuscripts do not contain 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. In other words, they're telling you, you don't have to believe that if you don't want, okay? We, yeah, it's not really, we don't think it really is in the Bible, but we put it in there because it's the new King James, okay? So they felt like they had to put it in there, but they didn't really believe, the scholars didn't really believe that it belonged there, but it does. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So, so far, we have the Bible teaching us that the spoken word is fully divine, fully part of the Godhead. Let's move on. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, again, let's stop right here. Notice that in this verse, the word was made flesh. So that identifies the word mentioned in, first, in John chapter 1, the Word was God. So that's Jesus because it's identified in verse 14 as the Word becoming flesh. The Word was made flesh. So we know that the title of the Word is given to Jesus Christ who came down from heaven, came in the form of flesh or sinful man, all right, even though he had no sin. And that that same Word that became flesh, when people beheld Jesus, they saw his glory, and what they were seeing was, according to this verse, they were seeing the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Think about that. Because we're going to see a verse here in a little bit that identifies that both Jesus has truth and is full of truth, and his word is full of truth. And this is where we're going here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you verse after verse after verse after verse where it says one thing about Jesus and it says the identical thing about the Bible. So is it heresy? Is it a cult? Is it some terrible thing to place when you say, I believe in Jesus and I believe in his word, is it some terrible thing really that we ascribe the same thing that the Bible says about Jesus to his word? No, because the Word of God does it. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, so far, we've seen that the Word of God, the Word, is Jesus, is divine, is fully God, came down, took on the form of flesh, so he's fully God and fully man, and that Jesus, in his God state, is the spoken Word of God. And so you get a lot of people say, yeah, I believe in the spoken word of God. I believe in Jesus. But here's what they'll say. I don't believe that the Bible or any translation of the Bible can be totally true and inerrant. I don't believe that. They, believe, they say they believe in Jesus. Okay, I'll give them that. But when it comes to believing that the physical printed Bible that they have has all of the attributes that Jesus has, including being totally true, trustworthy, faithful. When, when God speaks, it's in the Bible, 100%. They, they have been taught by the scribes. They have been taught by the pastors. They've been taught by the seminarians. They've been taught by all the books and the denominations that they can't believe that the Bible that they have handled in their hands is as trustworthy as Jesus Christ is. They, they've been told that they can't believe that. They've been ridiculed. They've been mocked for believing it to begin with. And some people have decided that they're not going to follow that or believe that because people will make fun of them. I'm here to tell you that believing in Jesus 
and believing in the Bible, you cannot separate the two. They can't be, and when I say Bible, I don't mean some mystical uh, word of God that the Spirit gives to people individually, but it's not written anywhere, and I don't, I don't limit the phrase, the Word of God, to the original manuscripts. I don't, I don't limit it. The reason why I don't limit it is because the Bible doesn't limit God's inerrant Word only to the original manuscripts. Let me show you that. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, now if we were to go back to look at John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. So let's go back and look at John, 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word. Notice it's capitalized again. The Word of life. There's many things here. Number one, the Word of life is Jesus Christ. And here's the attributes now. The attribute of the Word of life, the Word giving life or being full of life, is given to both Jesus and the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a life, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And here we have 1 John 1, 1. He's referencing John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. He says, that which was from the beginning. And he says, our hands have handled of the Word of life. So now we have the attributes of Jesus ascribed also to the Word. And again, not just the original manuscripts, not just maybe some emotion that you felt from a spirit, but he specifically mentioned that it was handled in our hands. I've never touched the real Jesus. I did not put my, my finger through the holes in his hands. I did not thrust my hand in the wound in his side like Thomas did. I can only say that I have handled the Bible. Therefore, I have handled the word of life. And the word of life and Jesus being the life, they are one and the same. You cannot separate the two of them. If the Bible ascribes life in Jesus and the Bible ascribes life in his word that we have handled, then there is no other conclusion to draw. That means that if it's Jesus, it's the Bible. And if it's the Bible, it's Jesus. Some would say, I trust Jesus, but I don't always trust the Bible. I believe that no translation is perfect. Therefore, what they're saying is, I believe that some things I see in my Bible are not true. That's what they're saying. And yet they say that Jesus is always true. Jesus never lies. He is God and he cannot lie. So here's what you're saying. You're saying that I believe my Bible can be dishonest and not truthful 100% of the time. Because that's what you're saying when you're saying, I don't believe my Bible is perfect. I don't believe the King James is perfect. That's what you're saying. But then you're saying, I believe that Jesus, the Word, is 100% true and never lies because He's God and God cannot lie. This also, by way of its title, the Word, is also incapable of telling a lie. Everything in it must be true. Let's move on. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. We know who that is. We know it's Jesus. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, 
and his name is called the Word of God. Now, I've underlined several things in these verses. He says, number one, he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and then his name is called the Word of God. I want you to notice Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, thy word is true from the beginning. Notice Jesus is called faithful and true, and he's called the Word of God. And Titus and Psalm tell us that the Word, the Bible, is faithful, and the Word, the Bible, is true. Notice in Titus 1.9, it says, holding fast the faithful Word. Again, 1 John 1.1 1, 1 says, that which our hands have held. Titus 1 says that we are holding fast the faithful Word. Psalm 119 says, the word is true, or thy word is true. So it also says, so it says that Jesus is faithful and true, and that he is the word of God, and that our Bible is both faithful and true. So my question to you is, how can you separate what the Bible says about Jesus and what the Bible says about the Bible? How can you say that Jesus is better than the Bible, which you believe to be inferior because you think that this translation has mistakes? And again, if you say, well, I, I don't believe that the Bible lies in the original manuscripts. Have you ever handled the original manuscripts? The answer is no, because you, the original manuscripts do not exist anywhere. The only thing that you and I can handle with our hands and hold fast with our hands is this Bible. They cannot be separated. Now, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. I'm going to show you two columns. One is going to be verses that talk about Jesus and give one of his attributes. The other column is the Bible speaking about the Bible, giving it the exact same attribute. Are you ready? Here we go. Revelation 19, 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Notice in Mark chapter 9, verse 7, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. So number one, Jesus is commanded by God that we should hear what Jesus had to say. Luke chapter 5, verse 1, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And so the attributes of Jesus is, is that we hear Jesus. The attributes of the Bible is, is that we hear the word of God. And we are commanded in many other places to give heed to the word of God. In fact, I've got a verse right here in my mind. Let's see if I can find it very Oh, yeah, it's in uh, 2 Peter. And I've already got, what, 75 slides worth of scripture? I'm going to give you more, okay? I'm going to give you so many scriptures. And at the end of this, you have to ask yourself the question, if you still believe that the Bible, the King James Bible, if you still believe that it cannot be 100% true, my question to you is, what scripture do you use to base that on? Now, not some scripture that you think was translated incorrectly. What scripture tells you that the Bible would ever fall into corruption? From the first time it was written down, I believe that was the inerrant word of God, to how the manuscripts were preserved over, year, over the years, I believe those were the word of God. Paul said it to Timothy. He said, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Timothy didn't have original manuscripts. He had copies. And more than likely, he had translated copies. We don't know that for sure. But we know that what Timothy had was copies of the originals. And yet Paul referred to them as holy scriptures. Okay? So I believe that the copies were preserved and holy. I also believe that the translation must be be holy and preserved and can and has and is the infallible word of God. Second Peter, uh, let's see here, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take 
heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So here we're commanded to hear in, in Revelation in Mark chapter 9, we're commanded to hear Jesus. And in Luke 5, they came to hear the word of God. And in 2 Peter chapter 2 or chapter 1, verse 19, we are commanded to give heed to the word of God, the sure word of prophecy. So see the attributes? Jesus, we're commanded to listen to Jesus. We're also commanded to listen to the Bible. They both contain the same attributes. Let's move on. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, meaning Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Jesus is to be received. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye have heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So we see that both Jesus was received and the word of God is received. John chapter 1 verse 14, we see that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Acts 20 verse 32, we see that it's called the word of his grace uh, among all them which are sanctified. And John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. So we see that both Jesus and the Bible are full of grace. It's called the word of his grace. We see that it sanctifies us and we see that thy word is truth. Jesus is truth and his word is truth. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the Prince of Peace. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is given the title of the Prince of Peace. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now look at Romans 10, 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace peace. Notice the gospel, the words of God are full of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. First Peter 1 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Acts 10 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. So both Jesus who is the Prince of Peace, and we have peace through Jesus, we also receive peace from the preaching of the Word of God. John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Jesus is the way. Psalm 119, verse 35, the Bible is referred to as the path of thy commandments. Psalm 119, 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. So both Jesus is the way and the Bible, the word of God, is the way that we follow. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth. John 18, 37, everyone that is of the truth Heareth my voice. So we know that Jesus is fully truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye have heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you, that belief. So we see that both Jesus is the truth and the word of God is the truth and it's not ever the word of men. Here are some more verses that say the same thing. John 1 14 again, he is full of grace and truth. Psalm 119 verse 151, thou art near O Lord and thy commandments are truth. It doesn't say that the commandments or the Bible contains the truth. It says they are truth. Psalm 119, verse 43, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. Psalm 119, 142, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. And I'm going to stop right here. So what we're seeing is, we're seeing exactly what I told you, that the Bible ascribes certain characteristics to Jesus, like he is the, uh, the way of peace. The Bible is the way of peace. He is the truth, Jesus is the absolute truth. The Bible is the absolute truth. Both the Old and the New Testaments tell you 
that the Word of God is absolutely the truth. And I'm going to ask you again, can you find a verse? Can you show me a place in the Bible where it says that the Word of God, whether it be original manuscripts, copies of manuscripts, or translations of the Bible, can you show me anywhere in the Bible where it says that any one of those three would not be the truth? Those verses don't exist. They're not there. And where do we get our doctrine from? All scripture is given by your inspiration of God. Let me say that again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God Scripture. You know what the word scripture means? It doesn't just mean floating words out there that maybe a spirit spoke to you on the inside of you. It doesn't mean that. Scripture means that it was inscripted. A scribe scripted the words, inscribed the words, wrote them down. When your doctor tells you you need a certain medicine, where can I get it? Go to the pharmacy. Tell them I said that you could have Vicodin, right? Okay? So you go to the pharmacy and say, uh, yeah, my doctor, I just came from there. He said I could have like a great big bottle of Vicodin. <clears throat> Are they going to give it to you? No. Why? You need a prescription, a script. They don't trust you, especially with Vicodin nowadays. They don't trust you. They only trust what is written. And nowadays, I've seen that they put all kinds of little safeguards so that to make sure that the pharmacy, when they receive this piece of paper, they can check to know beyond any doubt that that doctor wrote that script and that they should give that person this amount of this kind of medicine. It works that way in medicine and yet some people say that they can't trust Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. Where is it that we're to get our doctrine? We're supposed to get it from the Word of God. Jesus is deity. Where do we get that from? The Word of God. There are three in that, in that Godhead. Where do we get that from? We get it from the Bible that we are atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Where do we get that from? <clears throat> we get it from the Bible. The prophecies, prophesying that Jesus would come, where do we get that? They're in the Bible. The prophecies that, Jesus, that says that Jesus is coming again, where do we get that? We get it from the Bible. The doctrine of what we're supposed to believe about the Bible, where do we get it from? Most people are not getting their doctrine of the Bible from the Bible. They're getting their doctrine of the Bible from men, but not God. Revelation 3, 7, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Psalm 119, 160, thy word is true from the beginning. And so, here again, the Bible is saying Jesus is true. The Bible is saying that the Bible is. Let's go back and look at that verse. Thy word is true from the beginning. From the beginning, it's true. And the word is, Bill Clinton may have a problem with it. I don't. The word is means right now. Do you believe that? Thy word, God's word, is right now true. Unless you have a verse that contradicts that idea, I think it's best that you believe exactly what the Bible says, not what someone makes it out to be. 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life. Colossians 3, 4, When Christ who is our life, Christ is the life, the Bible. Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life. John 6.63, 6, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. 
Proverbs 6, 23. Reproofs and instruction are the way of life. So again, the attributes of Jesus are that he is life, he is our life, and the Bible is the word of life. John 19, 36. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled, a bone of him should not be broken. Jesus cannot be broken. John 10, 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Both Jesus and the Bible cannot be broken. John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Job 23, 12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus is the bread. The Bible is the bread. The words of God are our food. They are the bread of God. John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. 2 Samuel 22, 29, for thou art my lamp, O Lord. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Bible, Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. Jesus is the light. The word of God is the light. John 9, 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Philippians 2.15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So both Jesus is the light of the world, and Jesus said uh, in Matthew 5, ye are the light of the world. Philippians 2.15 says that we as the sons of God shine as lights in the world. So, a son of God is a light unto the world. Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. 2 Peter 1, 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Both Jesus as the son of God is the light and the Bible is the light of the world. The, Jesus is the fire, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Jeremiah 23, 29, is not my word like as a fire? Jeremiah 5, 14, wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because thou speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. Both Jesus is the fire of God and the word is fire. Zechariah 2, 5, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire. Again, the Lord is a fire. The Bible, his word is a fire. Oh, I like this one. 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Jesus is very precious to me. 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Psalm 126, 6, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again. Uh, in the parable of the seed and the sower, the word is the seed or the seed is the word. The Bible is precious. Jesus is precious. You cannot separate the two. Song of Solomon 5.16, his mouth is most sweet. And this is a prophecy of the church and Jesus. Psalm 119.103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 19.10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey of the honeycomb. Both Jesus is sweet and the word is sweet. By the way, Jesus in Song of Solomon, his mouth is sweet. What is it that comes out of his mouth? His word. His word is sweet, people. His word is precious. So is Jesus. Romans 5.11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So joy comes from Jesus. He is our joy. Philippians 3.3, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So we see here in Jeremiah 15 that the word is both joyful and is the rejoicing of our heart. 
Romans 5 tells us that joy comes through Jesus and that we rejoice in Christ. Stop right here. Again, we are seeing that the attributes of Christ are the same as the attributes given to the Bible. We rejoice when we hear the Word of God. We rejoice and have joy coming from His Word. If you are a Christian and you read the Bible and at times don't just get full of joy, Sometimes when I put things together like I'm doing now, when I'm working on it, or sometimes when I'm just reading the Bible and God's putting things together in my mind for me, I get this big smile on my face. It literally brings me happiness and joy. And I would rather have that happiness than the happiness that the world brings. So we get joy from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, but the Bible says we get joy from His Word. They are one in the same. Let's move on. John 15, 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. 1 John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Our joy comes from Jesus, and our joy comes from the written Word of God, the Holy Bible that we've handled in our hands. Jesus is wonderful. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us, Psalm 119 tells us that thy testimonies are wonderful. Revelation 1, 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Thy, see, the testimonies are the word of God and they are wonderful and Jesus is wonderful. Again, Jesus is the counselor, Isaiah chapter 9 tells us. Proverbs 22, 20 says, Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge? Notice they are written. Psalm 119, 24, Thy testimonies are also my delight and my counselors. Jesus is our counselor, the written word of God, our counselors to us. 1 Corinthians 1, 24, Christ is the power of God. If we're to have power in our lives, we get it from Jesus Christ. Luke 9, 43, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples. So the mighty power of God are the things that Jesus did. Jesus is the power of God, and he gives us that power. Matthew 22, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So is it Jesus, the power of God, or the Word, the Scriptures? Are they the power of God? Both of them. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is quick and powerful. Both the Bible, the Scriptures, and Jesus are full of God's power. Luke 4.32, and they were astonished at His doctrine, for His Word was with Power. 2 Corinthians 6, 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let me stop right here. Let me address this just for a minute. I've got so many verses here. I'm trying to move through some of them, but some of them I just got to stop right here. And let's talk about this for a minute, because I'm going to ask you a question. We have found out in life that we have no power over our flesh. And I know there's a lot of gurus in churches right now that are trying to convince you that if you just play little thought games and meditate enough and speak power words, that you can have power over your body. You can, you can, you can heal yourself. You can stop sinning by your own willpower. But you see, both you and I know that's not true. You haven't stopped. Oh, you quit for a while, a couple days maybe, week, 12 hours. But you have no power over your flesh. So I'm going to ask you a question. The power that we need as Christians in some days just to keep going. Just to to keep from wanting to die. I've been there. 
do you think that power is going to come from what a man says or from what God says? Jesus is the power of God and the word of God is the power of God. My faith and my confidence in order to get this power does not come from men, even good men that I know. It doesn't come from them. I could tell you something all day long. I could sit here for two hours and try to convince you without the Bible that you should believe the King James. But I, I don't have any power to convince you of anything. And if I convinced you of it one day, somebody else could convince you of the opposite two days from now. And yet, if you see these verses and you're reading them like I am and you're going, you know what, that's what the Bible says. Then your faith then is in what the Bible says and not what the men say. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you. Your doctrine, if you believe, or as you tell people, I don't believe that any translation can be perfect. If your doctrine has come from men, because obviously you did not read that in the Bible. Because if you did, you would have sent me the verse. You would have said, Pastor, according to Ecclesiastes 6, verse 8, the word will corrupt. You didn't read that. There is no such verse. Where does your doctrine come from? Does it come from men or does it come from the word of God? Where's your faith? Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by men? No. Hearing by the word of God. Psalm 119, 6. Jesus is good. Thou art good and doest good. Acts 10, 38. Um, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. So Jesus is good. Isaiah 39, 8. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. Hebrews 6, 5. And have tasted the good word of God. Psalm 119, 39. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Remember how we said the Word of God tasted like honey. Honey's good, okay? Honey is, honey is awesome. For God to make that, whew, man, that is amazing, all right? No one ever eats honey, unless the honey's gone bad. No one ever eats honey and says, oh, I detest honey. Honey's awful, okay? Honey's good. So is the Word of God. You've tasted it, haven't you? Jesus is good. The Word of God is good. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Notice that Jesus has been anointed with the Holy Ghost. 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. John 17, 17, sanctify, through thy, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So first John and John together are telling us that the word being truth is anointed and Jesus is anointed. They are one and the same. You cannot separate the two. I mean, it, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? Right here. He's been right here the whole time. And this is the cornerstone that people have rejected. And you say, oh, pastor, now, you, now, you, now I got you. Jesus is the cornerstone. Let me show you how Peter ties them both together. In 1 Peter chapter 2, um, verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So we know that Jesus, him, is the chief cornerstone. Verse 7, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. So here it identifies that Jesus is both the stone that is the chief cornerstone, but he also identifies Jesus as the disallowed stone and the stone of stumbling. And then he says that um, even to them which stumble, 
at the Word. Jesus is the stone of stumbling and the Word is the stone of stumbling. They're both the same. So think about what it means. If you reject the Bible, what are you rejecting? The stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Even to them that which stumble at the word being disobedient. Think about it. They're one and the same. John chapter 1, verse 1 again. In the beginning was the word. The same was in the beginning with God. Revelation 22, 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Psalm 119, 160, thy word is true from the beginning. Jesus was in the beginning. The word was in the beginning. They both were there in the beginning. Psalm 90 says that Jesus is from everlasting to everlasting. Micah chapter 5 is the prophecy concerning Jesus being born in Bethlehem, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Isaiah 30, verse 8, now go write it before them in a table and note it in a what? A book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. These are teaching you that Jesus is always was, always is, and always shall be, and the word is forever and forever. And he said the purpose of taking the words of God and writing them in a what? Book. Was so that it could be forever and ever. Yes, they are God's words, but God is the one who chose the method both of transmission, which means he took his words and put it in the mouths of the prophets, but he also chose the method of preservation, noted in a book, so that it would be for how long? The original manuscripts? No. Forever and ever. Jesus is everlasting. The book is everlasting. Both, they're one and the same. Psalm 9, 7, but the Lord shall endure forever. 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. They both endure forever. John 12, 34, Christ abideth forever. Revelation 4, 10, him that liveth forever and ever. 1 Peter 1, 23, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And again, Isaiah 30, verse 8, the book is forever and ever. Ever. They both, Christ and the book, abide forever and ever. Daniel 2, 44, the kingdom shall stand forever. Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Notice that they both stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall do what? Stand forever. Am I convincing you yet? Jesus abides forever. The words noted in the book abide forever. Jesus' kingdom stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. And notice this, Isaiah 40, and Peter quotes it. It says almost the same thing, that the grass withereth. And I've taught this, but I'm going to give this just very briefly in this context. The original manuscripts were written on two things, vellum or papyrus. Very quickly, vellum is animal skin, flesh. Papyrus is where we get the word paper from, and it's a type of grass that they wove together, dried it in the sun. Isaiah said all flesh, vellum, is grass, like the papyrus. The grass withereth. This is why we don't have the original manuscripts, because they withered away. But the, word of our, but the word of the Lord, or the word of our God, standeth forever. God never intended that the perfect word of God would only exist on the grass, because he knew the grass would wither. He spoke the grass as being withered away. He always intended that his word would endure forever, even after the grass, the papyrus, the original manuscripts, 
faded away. Okay? You get that? Even though the original manuscripts have disappeared because they were written on grass, God's Word would endure forever past the originals. Luke 20, verse 17, Jesus is the stone which the builders rejected. And in verse 18, whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Romans 9, 32 and 33, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, because as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. We noted that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. They stumble at Jesus, they stumble at the word, both of them. Matthew 28, Jesus said, I am with you always. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee. Psalm 119, 98, thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Whether it's Jesus or his commandments, the Bible, they will always be with us and they will never leave us. Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. Psalm 115, 11, he is our help and our shield. In Psalm 119, 175, let thy judgments help me. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield. Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It doesn't matter how you, how you look at it. God is our helper. God is our shield. God's judgments help us. The word of God is pure. He, the word of God is our shield. It is our shield of faith. Because let me tell you something. The devil is tossing fiery darts at you. He's meaning to cause you to be destroyed. He wants you to destroy your faith. You have only one shield to, to protect you from that, and that is a shield of faith. Do you believe what God said? Or has the devil already successfully hit you and attacked you as far as the Word of God is concerned and you don't trust the only thing that God told you to trust. You don't trust it because you were told there was mistakes in it. But you never read a verse that said there's mistakes in it. Never happened. Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Christ dwells in our hearts. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you. So Christ lives in us. He dwells inside of our hearts. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Christ dwells in us. His word dwells in us. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Jesus abides in us and his words abide in us. Christ dwells in our hearts. The word of God dwells in our hearts. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 1 John 2, 14, I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you. Psalm 119, 28, my soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. Where's our strength come from? Does it come from Christ or does it come from the Bible? It comes from both. Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, Faithful is he that calleth you. 2 Timothy 2, 13, Yet he abideth faithful. Psalm 119, 138, Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Titus 1, 9, Holding fast the faithful word. Christ is faithful. Christ can always be counted on. His word is faithful. His word can always be counted on. Revelation 19, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4, 12, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus is the sword of the Lord. His Word is the sword. Luke 9, 47, and Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart. Jesus could perceive the thoughts of the hearts of the people around him. Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is quick and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Notice that Jesus perceived, how did Jesus perceive their thoughts? 
It's because Jesus is the Word of God that can discern the thoughts of men. How many, how many times have you read the Bible? Or how many times has the preacher preached and you got real nervous and you started sweating and you didn't want to say amen, but you said amen anyway because you didn't want people to think you weren't saying amen because you were under conviction. But the truth of it was the word of God that the preacher preached was right to you and you were wondering how the preacher knew what you were doing. The preacher didn't know what you were doing, but the word of God did. The word of God always knows what you're doing. It always does. Romans 4, 17. God quickeneth the dead. It means makes them alive. Adam was made a quickening spirit. You hath he quickened. So Christ raises us up. The last Adam is Christ. He is a quickening spirit. That means that he makes things come to life. Psalm 119, 50. For thy word hath quickened me. Psalm 119, 93. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. Psalm 119, 149. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgment. Psalm 119, 154. Plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me according to thy word. Stop right here. Jesus is the quickening spirit that makes us come to life. His word quicken the, quickens us. Quicken means to make alive. It brings us back from the dead. His word does. Think about a guy by the name of Lazarus, dead four days. I have a family member who picks up dead bodies for a living. He got a call one day while we were having a family get together. He asked me to help him. I said, sure, I'll help you. It was only when we pulled up to the place that he told me what was going on. It was in a trailer court and the neighbors smelled a strong smell coming out of this trailer. Sheriff's deputy was sitting outside in a patrol car. He had already been in the house doing a welfare check saw the dead man back in his bedroom, flies on him, skin had turned black. Sheriff's deputy told my family member and said, unless you see a gun or a knife in there, I don't want to go in there. Meaning, if it's natural causes, then I don't need to go in there. If it's a gun or a knife, I'll investigate. But he didn't want to go in there. It was bad. This man had been dead four days. I've seen a body dead four days. It's bad. Lazarus was dead four days. The only thing that me and family member could do was put this old guy in a body bag and take him to the mortuary and you can't even embalm something like that. It's too gone. How did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Did he do chest compressions on him? Did he give him blood, plasma, okay, IVs? Did he give him any injections? What? No. What did he do? He spoke. Lazarus, come forth. Three words. Three is the number for resurrection, by the way. Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. Lazarus, come forth. The spoken word of God raised a dead man back to life. The word of God will give you life. Let me explain something. At one time in my teenage years, I believed that the King James was the only true word of God in English. When I went to Bible college, went to two different Bible colleges, and they succeeded in killing that idea in me. I no longer believed it. I believed that all the translations had mistakes in them, and we could never know really totally what the word of God said. I believed that because that's what was taught to me. And so my idea of an infallible word was killed off in me. One day, God resurrected it with his word. Brought it back to life. That's what I'm hoping to do with you today. John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So Christ gives us the power to have a renewed birth, becoming the sons of God. No longer becoming the sons of our fathers. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. James 1, 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Jesus brings us back to life and with his power we become the sons of God and it's the word of God that brings us a new birth. We are born again by the incorruptible seed. 
Jesus is to be eaten. John 6, 57, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Verse 58, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. The Bible is to be eaten. Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Galatians 5, 1, Christ has made us free. Christ gives us liberty, freedom. John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Wow. Ezekiel 20, 12, the Lord sanctifies us. The Lord, I am the Lord that sanctify them. 1 Corinthians 1, we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 5, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by what? The word. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 19, that we might be sanctified through the truth. 1 Timothy 4, 5, for it is sanctified by the word of God. Jesus sanctifies us, the Word sanctifies us. Jesus Christ, His Son, according to John, cleanseth us from all sin. John 15, 13, now you are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Wherewithal, Psalm 119, 9, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy Word. Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. James 1, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Christ is able to save us. His word is able to save us. John, 1 John 3, 3, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Jesus is pure. Pure. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. Psalm 119, 140, thy word is very pure. Now, again, let me stop right here. Which do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is pure? Surely you wouldn't say that Jesus is defiled, would you? You wouldn't say that Jesus is corrupt. You, didn't, you wouldn't say that Jesus has a spot or a blemish on him. You wouldn't say that Jesus has sin, would you? You wouldn't say that Jesus is corrupt, would you? No. Why would you say it about his word? Why would you say that his word has been corrupted? Why would you say that his word isn't pure? Why would you say that the Bible is not the pure word of God? when the Bible clearly tells you that it is and that it will remain pure. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7 says, the words of the Lord are pure words, present tense. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Remember, it was written in a book. For what reason? so that it would last forever and forever. God promised that his pure word would last forever and never be corrupted. So why would you think that this word is corrupt? Why would you think it had a mistake in it? Man told you that. God's word never told you that, never did. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Jesus is to be loved. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Anathema means curse. Maranatha means the Lord is coming. So it means let him be cursed at his coming. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. So do you love the Lord Jesus? I'm sure you do. Do you love the Bible? Psalm 119, 97, oh, how I love thy law. Psalm 119, 119, I love thy testimonies. 127, therefore, I love thy commandments. 159, consider how I love thy precepts. If you love Jesus, you have to love his Bible. 
Jesus is to be meditated on. Psalm 104, verse 34, my meditation of him shall be sweet. Psalm 63, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Psalm 1, 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 1, 19, 15, I will meditate in thy precepts. Verse 23, meditate in thy statutes. Verse 148, that I might meditate in thy word. So which is it? Are you going to meditate on Jesus or meditate on the Bible? Which is it going to be? Revelation 3, 7. These things saith he that is holy. Mark chapter 1, verse 24. He is the holy one of God. Jesus is the holy one. Romans 1, verse 2. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Is Jesus holy? These things saith he that is holy? Is he the holy one of God? What about the Bible? Is the Bible the holy scriptures? Is your Bible as holy as Jesus is? Acts chapter 2 verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The holy one is Jesus. And while Jesus was, let me stop right here. Jesus is the Holy One, and while Jesus was in the tomb, God did not allow His body to decay. God did not allow corruption to happen to Jesus. Corruption could not touch Jesus. Jesus, the Holy One of God, is incorruptible. Right? 1 Peter 1.23 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus is not corruptible, and his word is not corruptible. You have to ask these questions. Do I believe in the incorruptible seed of the word of God? And again, you did not read the original manuscripts. You have not even read the copies in Greek and Hebrew. So if all you have is, well, I believe the Word of God is preserved in the original manuscripts or in the, in the original languages, how then can you be saved by them when you're saved by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God? Somebody wasn't reading Hebrew to you and you jumped up and said, I need to receive the Lord Jesus in my heart. Somebody was reading or you were reading this Bible, which is incorruptible, which gives you everlasting. By the way, if Jesus is incorruptible and his word is incorruptible, then your salvation, if it's real salvation, it's incorruptible. Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you. God works in you. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, The word of God effectually worketh also in you that believe. God works in you. The Bible works in you. All things were made by Him. John chapter 1, verse 3. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Jesus made everything. The Bible makes everything. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. How do we overcome? By the blood of the Lamb. 1 John 2, 14, the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Psalm 17, 4, concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips have, have I kept me from the paths of the destroyer. You overcome by Jesus and by the blood of the Lamb, and you overcome by the Word of God. John 5, 14. Behold, thou art whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. John 8, 11, She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. When Jesus is with us, we sin no more. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus causes us not to sin. His word causes us not to sin. 
Romans 2, 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Jesus knows all the secrets and he will judge men. John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and reject and receiveth not my words. You see how even Jesus fastened himself to his words? Hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So which is it? Is it Jesus that's going to judge you or is it the Bible that's going to judge you? The answer is both. They are one and the same. And Jesus even said in John 15, he said, abide in me and I in you. And then he said, my words abide in you. Here in John 12, 48, he said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. Even Jesus fastened them together. They are one in the same. If we ascribe something to Christ, that we must also ascribe that to his word. If Jesus abides with us forever, then we must believe that his incorruptible word abides with us forever. And there cannot ever be a separation between Jesus and our Bible because he promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And any time I need Jesus, I have him by his word. 1 Corinthians 1.23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Acts 5.42, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is to be preached. 2 Timothy 4.2, Preach the word. Mark 2.2, And he preached the word unto them. Jesus is to be preached. The word is to be preached. Matthew 28, 5, And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus. Isaiah 55, 6, Seek ye the Lord. Jesus, God, the Lord, is to be sought after by men. We seek Jesus. Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, the Bible says. None shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. John 5, 39, Search the scriptures. Acts 17, 11, they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Jesus is to be sought after. His word is to be sought after and searched. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we are to bring everything under the obedience of Christ. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. James 1, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 2 Thessalonians 3, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. We're to obey Christ and we're also to obey his word. Now, I've spent, I don't know how many verses here that we've put together for you so that you could understand that the attributes given by the Bible concerning Jesus are the same attributes given by the Bible concerning the Word of God. They truly are one and the same. They are equal to each other. One is not superior to the other. Christ left us here and yet he promised to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus himself said that he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We, the Bible is Jesus Christ. The Bible is the Holy Spirit. The Word is God. And they cannot be separated one from another. Now, what I was asking God for when I was putting this together, I love typology. If you don't know what that is, Paul explained it as examples in the Bible. These things are written to you for examples. In other words, the things that we see, the stories that we see in the Bible, they are written for our learning. They are given to us as an example of how God works, how God does things. And so I was thinking about this and about 
you know, is it, am I really saying what's right here? Because, I mean, you read the verses just like I did. But maybe in your mind, you're still not, you're still not going, well, you know, I just, you know, I just believe, you know, I heard that, you know, there's mistakes in the translations and, and, you know, with the, that all the translations have errors in them and that, you know, we, the, the only Bible is the original manuscripts. I mean, that's all I heard. And, you know, I heard them ridicule and mock these, you know, people that believe every word in the King James and I don't want to be that. And maybe you still have doubts in your mind and I'm not trying to ridicule you in any way. I'm trying to reach out to you. You know, I tell people that, you know, one day the Lord just kind of visited me and said, Mike, this Bible's true. But I knew the Bible even teaches us not to believe every spirit, but to test these spirits. And so the thing that I started to do from that day forward was to not just accept it, but to search the scriptures and look for answers. Can I believe? that my Bible is incorruptible. Can I believe that my Bible, the one that I read every, I don't read Greek, I don't read Hebrew. The Bible that I read, the, the word that I've handled with my hands, the word that's been translated me, by the way, translated for me, by the way, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives the translation of unknown languages, does he not? Did not God say in Isaiah 28, 11, with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? And so in the day of Pentecost, what are they doing? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, with men of other tongues, plural, will he speak to this people? And on the day of Pentecost, they were not speaking Hebrew. They were speaking the Gentile languages of the people that had come, the Jews that had come to Jerusalem to worship there at Pentecost. And every man was hearing the word of God in his own language. So if you say, well, you're one of them King James only guys. No, I believe God speaks other languages. Do I believe God speaks Spanish? Absolutely. I believe also that God speaks English and that my Bible is the translation, the one interpretation of three unknown languages. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And so I just believe that my Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. And I hopefully have given you the scriptures to at least cause you to think of what the Bible says about the Bible. The Bible says that it was true from the beginning. The Bible says that that truth would last forever and that would, there would never be any corruption in his word. So with all these verses in mind, I, I asked God to show me in typology. Is there a picture of this? Did God draw a picture in our Bible of the fact that he preserved Jesus in a book. Let me show it to you. Revelation chapter 5. Let's look at it. The book and Jesus. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Where is Jesus right now? Jesus, according to Mark 16, 19, is at the right hand of God. Acts 2.33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. So we have the book at the right hand of God and we have Jesus at the right hand of God. Jesus and the Ten Commandments. I want you to think of the Ten Commandments as being a typological picture of the first and second coming of Jesus. I want you to think of it that way. Watch this. Exodus 32, 15, and Moses turned and went down from the mountain and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. Stop right here. Go back to Revelation 5. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Jesus is at the right hand of God. We have a book at the right hand of God, written on both sides. Notice now Exodus 32, the tables of stone that came down from heaven were written on both their sides, just like the book in Revelation 5. 
Wow. And the tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So I want you to think of these two tablets now. They are the law of God. Jesus, when he came, came made under the law. The two tables are, the, are a picture of the book that's in God's right hand because they're written on both sides. And here's Jesus at the right hand of God. So think of Jesus now coming down from heaven the first time. And the first time that Moses came down with the two tables in his hand, what happened? He saw the Israelites rejecting the law that was on those tablets because they were down there breaking just about everything that God had written on them, the Ten Commandments, right? So let's take a think about how Israel reacted to Jesus when he came the first time. What did they do? Look at it. Exodus 32, 19, it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and did what? Break them beneath the mount. What happened to Jesus when he came the first time? 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. You see that? The Jews rejected the law of God, Moses coming down with the book written on both sides, comes down and casts them to the ground and they're broken. And Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. And the Jews rejected him. So what happens? Moses goes back up to the mountain, right? What happened to Jesus? He went back to heaven. Is Moses coming back down again? Yes. Is Jesus coming back down again? Yes. Exodus 32, 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. Exodus 34, 32, And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and, gave, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. So the first time Moses comes down, Israel rejects that law, and the, that the tablets were broken. The first time Jesus came down, they rejected him and his body was broken. The second time Moses came down, the glory is greater. Now Moses' face shines and they can't even look at it. And by the way, when he comes down this time, he reads them the law and they hear it and they receive it. When Jesus comes again, they're going to receive him as their Messiah. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, earth chapter 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious. Jesus, when he came the first time, died. And the law that came down from Mount Sinai was death. It was a ministration of death, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And so what we see here is Christ is the tablets that came the first time, they rejected him. Christ is the tablets that came the second time without sin, and they received him, and his face is shining. His ex the glory of Moses' second time down the mount was greater than Moses' first time down the mount. Do you see that? And what I'm showing you is that Jesus is those two tablets. Those two tablets are showing the first and second coming of Jesus. And how does God show Jesus in the Old Testament? By way of the two tablets. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Let me stop right here. When Jesus came the first time and he's hanging on the cross, he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And the Jews around that cross had no idea what he was saying. When Moses was there at Mount Sinai and he comes down, he talks to the people, they can't understand him. He has does not have plainness of speech. When Jesus comes the second time, 
the Bible prophesies he's going to restore a pure language to them, and they're going to understand him. They're going to know. Moses could not use great plainness of speech, but now the second coming of Christ in the New Testament times, it's plainly understood who that is. Let's pick it back up. Verse 14, but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if we look at verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Remember what Jesus said about his blood? He said, this is the blood of the New Testament. So Christ is the Old Testament, and he comes in the form of the law, and he's the ministration of death, and he's killed, his body is broken, but then he comes down again. He's coming again. And Israel is going to receive him. They're going to receive his blood. And they're going to receive Christ, who is the New Testament. I'm telling you, everything in this Bible is pointing you to the fact that Jesus and the book, the written word of God, they are one and the same. I'm not done. I'll show you something else. In Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel was handed book from heaven. Get ready. Ezekiel 2 verse 9, And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was thereon. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. You Stop right here. Do you remember that? The book that God has in his right hand, where Jesus is, was written on both sides. The tablets that Moses came down from heaven with, written on both sides. This book, this roll of a book, a book, was written on both sides just like Moses' tablets, just like the book in God's right hand where Jesus is. This is all the same picture, people. Roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1, Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat, and it was in my mouth as honey. Notice this. It was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Now watch this. Ezekiel was given a book from heaven. And that book was written on both sides, just like the book in God's right hand. So he was given this book, and he was told to eat it. And he ate it, and it was sweet as honey. And he said, now go and speak to Israel. And if you keep reading in chapter 3, you'll see that God's telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I'm not sending you to people whose language you don't understand. I'm sending to you to the people of your own language. The Bible says that Jesus came unto his own the first time, and his own received him not. And so Ezekiel is taking the book, and he eats it. It tastes like honey. It's written on both sides, and he speaks to his own people in their language. Get ready. There's a nut, there is, just like in the Old Testament, there is the picture of Moses coming down the first time, and then Moses coming down the second time. Remember the hand? that when Moses put it in his bosom the first time, it came out with leprosy, okay? Jesus came down the first time bearing our sins, and he puts it in his bosom. When he pulls it out again, it's white, it's, it's clean. It doesn't have sin on it. Jesus, when he comes the second time, is coming without sin. Remember that, okay? There's another story, Ezekiel's story in the Old Testament, and he speaks to Israel in their language. There's another story in the New Testament of a book that came down from heaven was given to John. Let's look at it. Revelation 10, 1. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun. Think about Moses. Think about Jesus. And his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Revelation 10, verse 9. And he went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth. How? Sweet as honey. Think about it. So we have a little book given to Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel eats it, it tastes like honey. Ezekiel goes to the people who speak Hebrew. Now look at verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Verse 11, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations, and what? Tongues and kings. Let me stop right here. Jesus comes the first time. He comes to his own, and his own receives him not. Okay? When Ezekiel takes the book and eats it, it tastes like honey, it's written on both sides, he takes the book and eats it, and he goes to speak to Israel, and Israel doesn't hear him, even though he's speaking in their language. So now here we have John. We have an angel coming down from heaven. He has the little book in his hand open. I think that's the book that was in God's right hand that Jesus opened up, and it was written on both sides. Either way, the angel comes down from heaven with a book, a book, not a feeling, not an emotion, not, ooh, I got the spirit, a book. And he hands that book to John, and John eats that book, and it tastes like honey. And then he says, now go and speak, not just in the original Hebrew, but now that you have the Word of God in the form of a book, I want you to speak it to many tongues, many languages. One of those is English, obviously. This is the book in our language that God wanted us to have. And the book of Revelation is in it, okay? And this book came down from heaven. I have another story. Jesus is the gospel of God. He is the word of God. He's the book. Jeremiah 36. So the king sent a Jehudi to fetch the roll. Let me stop right here. Let me back up a little bit. Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah, <clears throat> Jeremiah, write out all these words on a book, on a roll of a book. So he did. He wrote them all out. So he took it and he sent it to King Jehoiakim, who's the evil king in Judah. So we pick up the story. So the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll and he took it out of Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudi read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month. And there was a fire on that hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, four leaves, how many gospels are there? It's four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He cut it with a pen knife. You know what that is? That's the word of God being broken up, just like the two tables were broken, just like Jesus' body was broken. And he cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Jesus is the book. He's the Word of God. And when He comes the first time in the four leaves, the four Gospels, He's broken, He's rejected. King Jehoiakim was a Jew. He's rejected, cut in pieces, cast to the hearth. The hearth where the fire was. Hearth has the word heart in it. The hearth was usually in the middle of a house. In the old houses, you had the hearth, the fireplace, in the middle of the house, in the midst of the house. Think of this earth, what's in the middle of this earth. And where did Jesus go after he died on the cross? After the Jews rejected him in the four leaves, the four gospels, where did he go? Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Acts 2, 27 says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Isn't it cool? Aren't, isn't that neat? The book. The book is given to Jehoiakim. He hates it. He hits the four leaves. He cuts it up, casts it into the fire. Do you think then that the words that God gave to Jeremiah are over with? Oh, no, it's dead. Do you think it was all over with when Jesus died on the cross and went to preach the spirits in prison, was in the heart of the earth for three days? Do you think God left his soul in hell? Do you think God allowed his Holy One to see corruption? No. What happened after Jehoiakim cut up, 
the three or four leaves and cast them into the fire. Look at verse 27 in Jeremiah 36. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll and the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying, Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. Now, let me stop right here. You're told, you're told that God's pure word of God only exists in the original manuscripts and they're gone. And yet God right here, once the original manuscript was gone, God simply had Jeremiah take another roll and write them out again. God preserved the book. He preserved the book, people. So we pick it up in verse 32. Then Jeremiah took another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe. By the way, Christ was the first roll. Christ is the second roll. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Not only did he get back all the words that he wrote the first time, he added to it words the second time. Christ, the first role, the Old Testament. Christ, the second role. Now we had the New Testament to it. God preserved his son, would not allow his, he did not leave his soul in hell. He did not allow his son, his holy one, to see corruption. And he has not allowed his word, his book, to see corruption. God always intended that he was going to preserve his word and that his word preserved would go out into the languages that people speak. Not just Hebrew, not just Aramaic, and not just Greek, but in the very language that we speak. I have a very quick little teaching some videos that we've done. I've done it this past week during our conference of how God preserved the word in the translation process. And I show you that by the word of God itself. If you know me, know my reputation, you know that if the Bible doesn't say it, I do not believe it. So if you try to convince me that there are mistakes in my Bible, I do not believe them. I do not believe there are. You know why? because the Bible promised me that it would be incorruptible and would never have mistakes in it, never be impure. So man tells me one thing, God's Word tells me something different. I have to believe God's Word. My hope is that after seeing all this, you'll at least stop and think and ask God to show you from here whether or not I told you the truth. That's all I want you to do. Because if you end up after this video reading this Bible, I've accomplished what God sent me forth to do, and that is to get you to read your Bible. I'll let God worry about the results because God can do it better than I can. I know it's been long, but I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I hope that you, I hope that, number one, if you already believe that this was the Word of God, then you remain convinced. You see it now in every word. But if you were like me years ago on the other side, because I didn't believe any translation was right, and I definitely didn't believe the King James anymore. I hated the King James people. God caught me on the road to Damascus and made me one of them. I hope he catches you the same. I hope this has been a blessing to you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.